evening. Good evening. I left my mic on, didn't, didn't I? I thought I turned it off. Um, well, welcome everyone to the Lord's house on this 12th Sunday after Pentecost. Honey, everybody knows my number. No, but Your fault. She proved friends both. Her fault. Just a few announcements before we get started. Uh, evangelism committee, don't forget, we meet on Monday, August 12th at uh, 6.30 in the Little Angels Room, which of course meets on Tuesday. We have the St. Mark's Council meeting. Council will meet on Tuesday, August 13th at 6 p.m. in the Little Angels Room. And of course, don't forget, we have a grief share seminar to begin on August 21st. Again, St. Mark's and Olson Gibson Funeral Home are sponsoring grief share seminar beginning at 1 p.m. Wednesday, August 21st at the Jefferson Senior Activity Center. If you have questions, Bob is right there and he can answer all of them for you. Don't forget about the Bible study opportunities again this week on Tuesday morning, and then we'll meet at Four Sisters Restaurant at 8 a.m. in Jefferson. Thursday morning, we meet in the Fellowship Hall, and we're in the Song of Solomon. And of course, Sunday morning after worship, we're in the Little Angels Room, and we're looking at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's all the announcements, with the exception of one I say for the end. Uh, for everyone who was involved in yesterday's funeral, the Heights family would like to thank all of you for what you did, the food, everything. Uh, they had a wonderful service, they said, and they appreciate everything that everybody did. So thank you all very, very much. Having said all that, are there any announcements I'm not aware of? If not, please rise. We follow our order of service as printed in our service folder and begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil, and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Open your hearts and minds to hear the word of the Lord. The first lesson is from 1 Kings, starting with chapter 19. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, and how he had killed all the prophets with a sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Be Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat under it, and prayed that he might add, I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread, baked over hot coals, and a jar of water. He ate and drank, and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled forty days and forty nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please read responsibly. Psalm 34 is printed. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. And his ears are attentive to their cry. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. And he delivers them. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And saves those who are crushed in spirit. The Lord redeems his servants. No one will be condemned who takes refuge in him. The second lesson is from Ephesians chapter 4. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. 
Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave, forgave you. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly beloved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for our consideration this evening is a portion of the gospel lesson recorded in John chapter 6, verses 41 through 51. Dear brothers and sisters of Christ. All right, Semper five, Marines, raise your hands. No Marines. I don't leave anybody out, but this is particularly about the Marines. So, Army, raise your hand. Navy? <laughs> Air Force? One. Coast Guard? Oh, this isn't helping at all. <laughs> How many of you were alive in 1918? <laughs> None, huh? Well, maybe you don't know, on June 10th, 1918, during the Battle of Below Wood in France, I asked for the Marines because there was a 44-year-old Marine Corps first sergeant. His name was Daniel Daly. Does anybody remember him? Know about him? He was just armed with a single pistol and a handful of grenades, and he single-handedly attacked and destroyed an enemy machine gun emplacement. That's pretty good, isn't it? Yes. You know, it was that kind of action from which legends are made of. But I got to tell you, that wasn't Dally's even most incredible thing he ever did. As a matter of fact, what he is best known for happened four days earlier. And it was from his leadership. Again, four days earlier, Master Sergeant, uh, Marine Corps First Sergeant, Daniel Daly, actually led his, his, his uh, unit, if you will, the 73rd Machine Gun Company, into battle, and they defeated the enemy that was there. And he led them into battle with a single sentence. And you know what that sentence was? It became famous. As a matter of fact, it's famous in the Marine Corps. You know what that is? Remember that? No! <laughs> no, Daniel Daly said, do you want to live forever? And he led his Marines into battle. And of course, those words have become a rallying cry for the United States Marine Corps because they will do whatever it takes to defend, to defend the United States, even if it means giving up their lives. Now, whether or not this statement is in the context of war or not, it is an interesting question, isn't it? A question that human beings since the Garden of Eden have been trying to answer. So I ask you, do you want to live forever? Well, the answer should be, I guess, yeah, right? Most human beings do not want to die. I mean, just look at what we do. Look at our actions. We think if we have the right health plan. We think if we follow the right diet. We think if we get the right treatments, if we go down to the gym and we work out, right? And trust me, I've seen a lot of flat-bellied experts that didn't live nearly as long as I have. <laughs> But we believe that. We believe if we do all these things, we can put off this thing called getting old. Would you like to die today? We're not anxious to die. I wouldn't want to do it. And part of the reason for that is that God did not create human beings to die. Death only entered this world with the fall into sin. Death was not a part of the cycle of living. So death isn't natural. I know a lot of people say that. It's the natural part. You're born and you die and you die. But God planned differently. God did not create his crown of creation. Human beings did not. In the beginning of the world, I should say in the beginning of the world, it was because of our first parents. They chose good over evil. They chose self over service. They chose Satan over God. And so they ate the forbidden fruit, and then death entered the world. As a matter of fact, God tells us, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all men, because all sin. Pandora's box was open. And death could not be put back into that box. The human race had given up on God. But God did not give up on them. So here's another interesting question for you. What if? Anybody play what if? Am I the only one? <laughs> what if? What if someone could stop death? What if death could be put back into that box? 
Better yet, what if someone could change death? In case you missed it. That's what Jesus was trying to teach the people in our gospel lesson for today. He said, I tell you the truth. He who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. So what is Jesus promising here? If Jesus was just promising that we could live forever on earth, and I've got to admit, since I've been back in Wisconsin, I could die here. But I could also live forever here. And I think all of you feel the same way. But if that was the case, if we could just live forever on earth, is it really a good promise at all? It's got to make you wonder, right? Because for the last few weeks, as you know, or as you are familiar with, you come on a regular basis, we have been traveling with Jesus through John's gospel for the last couple of weeks. We began with that wonderful miracle of feeding of the 5,000, where he fed all those people with loaves and fish. He had provided so much for the people that they had basketfuls of leftovers, and they saw the miracle that was to prove Jesus was the Son of God. As a matter of fact, John tells us, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. You see, that should be a good clue to us that Jesus did not come just to give us physical life forever here in this world. Jesus came to give us a quality of life that would be better than any life we would ever have in this world. He came to give us a life that would no longer be tainted by sin. And so when Jesus makes it clear that he was not the next Moses who was to come, he was not going to be the next political savior, they began to grumble and complain. This wasn't the Savior they were looking for. And as a matter of fact, that's what they caught Jesus saying here in our text. All those people looked at Jesus and said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? What they're really saying is, Come on, man. We've known you since you were a little boy playing games around our houses. We've seen you at work in the carpenter shop with your father. We've seen your whole life, Jesus. You didn't come from heaven. Their human reason could not wrap their heads around the thought that Jesus had come from God himself. He had come down from heaven to give them life. They were looking for a different kind of Savior. And it made me wonder. How about us? How about us? Do we find ourselves sometimes looking for a different kind of God? Do we see ourselves you know, grumbling and complaining to God because He isn't doing things the way we think He should do them? I mean, you've heard people say that you haven't, but I know they must wonder, God, why did you let my spouse, my husband, my wife die so suddenly? God, why are you doing all these things and letting all these stuff go wrong with my body? God, why don't you give me more money? Then I would be so much happier. But I'm sure if we are honest with ourselves, we all would have to admit that there are days when Jesus' words don't make sense to us either. There are days when we doubt His words. I had, it wasn't recently, but I had an experience with just such a thing. When Wendy and I were serving a small congregation in Pennsylvania, we had a wonderful opportunity to go to the Flight 93 Memorial in Pennsylvania. Uh, you remember that flight that was where the, the passengers rose up against their terrorists and of course the plane crashed and everyone was killed. And there's a beautiful memorial in that spot. And we got to go there and I've got to tell you, those displays that they have there is much further along than when we went. But when we were there, the displays were powerful. Everything in that museum um, put a human side on the events that happened that day. There were some of those displays that I needed to just walk away from. There were those displays that, well, you could read the messages that a husband left on his wife's voicemail just before the plane crashed. You had to walk away or else tears would just come pouring through your eyes. Now, I cannot imagine what it was like for those people who died that day. I mean, the terrorist attacks that were that day were just wrong and it was just so sad. Those people that died, those men who died were someone's husband, someone's father. The women that died were someone's wife, someone's mother. There were children that died. 
The people that died that day had gone to work or got on the plane as they had done many times before, but on that day, everything changed. It had to be incredibly difficult for the families of those victims. And I had to admit, I'm not sure how I would have felt. At least at that moment, if I would have been angry at God if my wife had died in that way on that day. And when events like that happen, you just cannot help but be reminded how short life can be. Jesus says to us this morning that he came to give us a life that is bigger than anything else in this world. And his words that he speaks to us are powerful. He says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. So he's telling us, he's saying to us, that life, real life, comes from him. Every single day, our Savior draws us to himself. Every single day, we sin. Every single day, we doubt his promises. And every single day, he keeps pulling us back to himself. I mean, you heard the readings for the day, right? The Old Testament lesson and the Epistle. Jeff reads them so well. But have you ever had a day like Elijah? You know, have you ever had a day just like Elijah where you've got a picture of life and it isn't the picture that God's painting for you? I mean, we may have our minds set on our future, our dreams for the future. But yet God may have a different future for you. A better one. And who of us haven't felt those feelings of bitterness, rage, and anger like Paul was describing in our epistle lesson? Each and every day, we lose our tempers. We lash out at the ones we love. And we intend, literally, to hurt others. Every day, we fail to be imitators of God. And yet in his love for us, Jesus continues to draw us back to himself, back to the bread of life. He tells us that all of those sins, that was a pretty good list of sins in the second lesson, wasn't it? All of those sins that Paul tells us to get rid of have been removed by Jesus' death on the cross. We can take comfort in Jesus' words. God's greatest delight is to patiently draw us back to his son over and over and over again so that we can taste and see what Jesus has done and what he continues to do for us. So, do you want to live forever? Is your answer still yes? Then I'll ask why. Why would you want to live forever? Well, Jesus has taken all of your sins and nailed them to a cross. Your sins are forgiven. He has put death back in the box. He has filled each and every one of his people, each and every one of us, with life. And that life changes everything. It changes how we think. It changes how we act. It changes how we feel about each other. Do you want to live forever? And remember what Jesus said to Martha. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection of the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you want to live forever? Well, then trust in Jesus, the bread of life. Brothers and sisters, this is God's word for you this evening. Speak right. Now may the peace of God which transcends all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us join together in confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, Light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. 
he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, you sent your Son to be the bread of life, giving eternal life to all who come to him. By your Holy Spirit, lead the whole church on earth to imitate you and walk in your love as beloved children. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give strength and courage to all pastors and those who assist them, especially those suffering from conflict, burnout, or depression. Harden them by the example of Elijah and the prophets and apostles before them. Comfort them through the forgiveness of sins and the promise of everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father in heaven, through holy baptism, you have joined the faithful together as your children, making us brothers in your Son, Jesus Christ. Give us grace to believe that through Christ we belong to one another. Let us put away all falsehood and malice, and instead to speak Christ's truth to one another in love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bless our families and homes that one generation may tell to the next the wonderful works of God in Christ. Bless fathers and mothers with health and strength to provide for their families. Bless the children and protect them from the evil one, that they may grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Hear our prayers for our nation. Cause us to live in harmony with one another and free our citizens from want, suffering, danger, and fear. Bless our presidents, members of Congress, our Supreme Court justices all who make, administer, and judge our laws, that we may live and worship you in peace and safety. Bless the members of our armed forces, law enforcement, and our first responders. Lord, in your mercy. Show kindness to the sick, including all who are on our prayer list and all whose names we carry in our hearts. Never let them be, de never let them be in doubt that you hear their prayers, relieve all pain, and provide for those who suffer from any kind of hardship. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless those who commune this day, that reconciled to each other in Christ's body and blood, they may rejoice to receive your forgiveness through this precious gift. Be strengthened in times of doubt, and be nourished in body and soul. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, you sent your Son to be the bread of life. Together with all the faithful who have gone before us, we give you thanks and praise. And to your hands, O Lord, we commit all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord, who also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, share the Lord's peace.
may this body which has been given for you, and may this blood which has been shed for you, strengthen and preserve you in the, new, in the true faith until life everlasting. You can depart from the Lord's table in joy and at peace with God. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His mercy endures forever. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, at your gracious invitation, we have partaken of the heavenly feast which you have prepared for your followers. How greatly you have honored us by receiving us as your guests. How richly you have blessed us with the great treasure of forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. Keep us ever mindful of the great love which moved you to suffer and die and shed your precious blood for us. Let this blessed sacrament serve to strengthen our faith, to deepen our love for you and our fellow man, and to increase our patience in all affliction. And let this communion here below produce a unique yearning in us for the blessed supper with you in heaven. Hear us for your name's sake, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.